Hey, good morning, folks. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Rob MacArthur here, uh, pastor of River Church Banff. Uh, thank you for coming on and watching our message. We're sorry that we're not live just now, but we do hope to be back live again uh, soon. Keep a, a watch out for that. But for today, uh, watch this message. I hope it speaks to your heart and causes uh, a shift in your life to see God do what only He can do in each one of our lives. Well, what a joy and a privilege it is to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Paul Manwaring, who's here with his um, wife Sue. They live in Windsor, um, and uh, he'll maybe share a little bit of his family and things when he comes up here. But uh, Paul shared uh, his testimony and some of Sue's last night. Really great to hear what God does with people. Amen? Amen. It's really great to hear people's testimonies. So, um, he wastes nothing. What was the next point? He, well, he gets. What's the next part of the? He's getting you ready, and you've got the. He's got the other three points right and ready to go. He's got them. He's going to preach that message. <laughs> he wastes nothing. He gets you ready. He wastes nothing in your life. Everything that's happened in your life, he'll use for a, his purpose, for his glory. Amen. Okay, so um, uh, uh, Paul is part of the senior leadership team in Bethel Church, um, but more than that, he loves, he really loves Jesus, um, and it's been great. You know, when you're fellowshipping with another uh, brother um, and you fall more in love with Jesus through that fellowship, that's, you know, a good relationship is when you, you're focused more on Jesus and your heart's drawn more to the Lord. That's the sign of a good relationship with someone. If it's the opposite, don't stay around that person. Okay, let's just FYI, uh, don't stare on that person if you're pulled away from Jesus. Amen. Okay, why don't we welcome Paul to speak this morning? Thank you, Robert. Thank you for your, your welcome. I've not known you very long, but feels like it's been uh, longer than the reality. <laughs> that was a good thing, all right? That was a good thing. Feels like I've known you a while. I think I've also worked out the secret of this church, all right? I think I've worked it out. It, it, was, it was founded by a fisherman who's married to someone who cleans the fish. I, I, you know, I was sitting there, I was sitting there and I thought, Paul, don't say gut fish, say clean the fish, because she's a Scottish lady. Uh, honestly, I, I saw, honestly, my thought in my head was, Scottish ladies don't gut fish, they clean fish, all right? That's what, uh, I, 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 that was honestly what I thought. I thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lower her down to the gutting fish job, you know? But you see, you've got a... And sometimes when you're a guest somewhere, it's helpful, I think, if somebody just holds up a mirror and says what you've got, because you can get so familiar and comfortable that you miss it. But to have the grandparents on the front row of the house, who are comfortable in the house, who aren't controlling the house, but are empowering the next leaders, is unusual. That's unusual. So don't take it for granted because a lot of places that would either be a problem an obstacle an interference be somebody that you the leaders currently constantly have to think what are they thinking I'm being totally serious this is unusual this is a huge blessing because there is a role for grandparents that that is so vital um, and and you have it and what they've done is they birthed another fisherman all right who's married to somebody who's about to be trained or is being trained to give birth to new life. Now, if you think about it prophetically, this is, this is powerful. This is a very beautiful environment. And I, I actually, one thing I wanted to say to you was that I found this environment very stimulating. Now, you know, I come from a pretty significant church that's influenced the world but I what it's trained me to do is to recognize other places that stimulate my spirit 
So I don't come here and go, oh, it's, you know, it's smaller than Bethel and, you know, it, it's not got Bill up here preaching and that sort of thing. What, it's, what Bethel's trained me to do is to recognize other houses that, that are stimulating. And I, I have this sense of, re- there's, a, there's a couple of things happening here. There's a, there's a, a spirit of stimulating your, your life with God, your growth in God. But I also have a really strong sense, and I said it last night, um, there's something here about the creation of home, of family, of a safe place. And um, I really feel that, and you guys have, you've created that between you, you two. I mean, you, you saw what Yvonne did this morning. She came up here and she cleaned the fish. I, may, I, 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 maybe I need to just explain it just a little bit. That's what she did. She cleaned the fish. She said, let's get you cleaned up a little bit more. And, and she came up and did that, and it's created this beautiful environment. So I just wanted to compliment you on that, and, and, uh, and of course the worship, which is, is just huge, you know? Uh, if, you don't, if you don't have worship that's, that's good, um, you've got a problem. But you have beautiful worship, you know? Amen. It's good worship. So um, I, I'm going to jump around just a, a few places um, teaching-wise this morning. Um, one, so Friday night I talked about encounters and encouraged you to value your encounters. Don't waste your encounters. And to um, just be aware that encounters aren't just for people on the platform with a microphone or who, people who write books. They're for all of us. And I believe that we're an encounter generation and that our encounters are preparing us or have prepared us for the world in which we now find ourselves. And uh, I tracked that through um, Paul, or Saul, on the road to Damascus, has an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. It transforms him. It rewrites his theology. It reframes the rest of his life. But it actually equipped him to address the problems of Corinth, which is very much a, a picture of our modern world. And if you study the culture of Corinth, the immorality, um, the sort of wisdom, people thought that you could get enough wisdom to not need God. You've got that all over the place on social media, in case you haven't noticed. And if you haven't noticed, I'm pleased for you. Um, but um, And then last night, as uh, Robert's already said, I had shared this message which I said to him always feels lazy to me because it's, it, it's just me sharing a message out of my life um, but he wastes nothing he gets you ready it's Romans eight twenty eight. all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose and uh, he wastes nothing not one moment of your life will he waste if you give it to him and then this morning really what I want to do is I, I really just want to encourage you as to who you are and I'm going to use language that you might say, if I just used the language, you'd say that's not who we are. But I want to encourage you that it is who you are. And um, I'll, I'll start with a slightly risky, risky thing to do, especially as I've now got to know Joe a little bit and know some of what he teaches. But I'm going to ask you a question, I'll ask you to put your hand up. How many of you here are apostolic? So we, we've got about three or four or five, maybe six, maybe seven people who are apostolic. Now here's, I ask this question everywhere I go. And uh, it's very deliberate. You see, I think that people hear me ask another question. I didn't ask if you were an apostle. I asked if you were apostolic. Let me just run through something with you, just briefly, if I may, because I, this will encourage you. Now, the evangelist job in the church is to equip the saints to be evangelistic. Would everyone agree with that? Yeah. Now, you are an evangelistic church. There's no doubt about that because it was founded by a fisherman who's married to somebody who cleans the fish, who, you know, has a son who takes it over, who is an evangelist, who's married to somebody who is helping people reproduce. If that's not an evangelistic foundation, I've never been in one. (laughs) The evangelist's job is to equip the saints to be evangelistic, yeah? The pastor's job is to equip the saints to be pastoral. Is that okay? The prophet's job is to equip the saints to be prophetic, yeah? Now, the teacher's job, a little bit more difficult language-wise, but I invented a word for this. The teacher's job is to equip the saints to be teacheric. (laughs) 
Now that's my word. If you're a school teacher, you can take that to school tomorrow with you and tell your pupils, uh, I, I'm, I'm teacheric, you know. But in other words, the, the teacher's job is to equip the saints to, to study the word of God in partnership with the Holy Spirit and, and to pursue a, a relationship and an understanding of the limitless one. So if all those four jobs is to equip the saints to be pastoral, evangelistic, prophetic, and teacheric, yeah? You okay with that? And you like teacheric word, I know. Then the apostle's job is to equip the saints to be apostolic. It seems logical to me. But here's what I find all around the world. Is that people here, when I ask that question, they think I ask if you're an apostle. And, and what's actually worse is, I come across some people who go to things called apostolic gatherings and they walk out and think because they were there, they became an apostle. Yeah, have you seen that problem? <laughs> so here's what I have to say to you. You're apostolic. Now, you see, in order to be apostolic, you need to come under the influence of an apostle. And you might say to me, well, we don't have an apostle. Well, you do. His name's Jesus. Hebrews chapter 3. And if you do what he did, say what he said, go where he went, believe what he believed, you're apostolic. And, and, and Jesus, one of my favorite verses of Jesus, he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And I don't believe he was just talking to the, well, actually, in the instance, he was talking to 10 of them when he said it. Because two were missing, Thomas and Judas. On the first resurrection Sunday night, the disciples, 10 of them, as I understand it, are locked in a room for fear of the Jews. They've, they've just come through, I mean, the worst week of their lives. They, a week before, they'd, they'd ridden into Jerusalem. They come into Jerusalem with Jesus on a donkey. The crowds, they, I mean, they didn't know it then, but they were inventing Palm Sunday. That's what they were doing. They, they're throwing the palms down, Hosanna in the highest. It's all amazing. But it's the beginning of a week where, where they sat at the, the one-sided Passover table that we all see. And, and, and they see their friend, you know, outed as the betrayer of Jesus. They see Peter deny Jesus three times. They see the, the chaos of the trial. They see the crucifixion. And now they're locked in a room on that first resurrection Sunday night. Chaos all around them. A world of chaos. How many of you have felt some chaos in recent years around you? Chaotic world. They felt powerless because the dead razor was dead. They felt purposeless. What are we doing Monday morning, guys? For three years, they knew what to do. Get up, follow him. Get up, follow him. Go where he goes. Do what he does. Say what he says. Believe what he believes. What's our purpose? What are we going to do? Do we go back to what we did before? It was chaotic. They felt powerless. They were purposeless. And not only that, they'd been betrayed by their closest friend. And into that room, into that room, that, that resurrection Sunday night, that first resurrection Sunday night, into that room, Jesus comes into the room. He says four things to them. I, I love the phrase before the Lord's Prayer in, in Matthew chapter 6. It says, your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask him. I love that phrase. I always say this. Sue and I pretty much know what our boys will want depending on who they contact first. <laughs> Any other parents got the same thing? Like, if it's a new football shirt, it's going to be Sue. All right? It's just the way it is. If it's some technology, it'll probably be me. If it's tickets to a concert, my, my eldest son, it'll probably be me. They, they, you know, if it's walk the dog, it'll be Sue. They, 
we know what they need before they ask because we know who they contact. It's this beautiful picture, but our Heavenly Father knows what we need before we ask him. Ten disciples locked in a room, chaos, purposeless, powerless, and betrayed. And into that room steps Jesus. Now, I'll take them out of order. But the chaos, he gives the answer, peace. Now, here's the thing. The first time I preached this, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, uh, well, peace is a greeting in that part of the world. I said, yeah, I know. The first one was a greeting. The second time, he said it twice. He said, peace. He's the prince of peace. The answer to your chaos is allow Jesus to walk into your room. This isn't my message, by the way. This is a free side rabbit trail. The second thing he said was receive the Holy Spirit. They felt powerless. Receive the Holy Spirit. If my understanding is correct, that is the first time that the Holy Spirit was given after the crucifixion, which is what Paul would later say, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. He gave the spirit the answer to powerlessness. He then said forgive. And one of the scariest verses I think in the Bible, if you don't forgive, their sins won't be forgiven. He's he's talking about Judas. He's got to be. See, the answer to us carrying unforgiveness is forgive. But then the verse that I'm trying to get to with that rabbit trail Although it's a good four-point message. You can have that one as well if you want. You can, get, you can put it with last night's four-pointer if you like. You can have that one. It's a four-pointer. That's all. I like four-point messages. I'm not a three-point preacher because I like to draw a cross and then have four boxes and fill them in. <laughs> the last thing he said was, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And what he actually is saying is, as the Father apostled me, so I apostolus you. So I send you. That's what he's saying. It's the answer to purposelessness. I I actually believe that those four things are are a, a, a a little picture of our world. Chaos, powerless, betrayed, and purposeless. And the answer is let the Prince of Peace in, receive the Holy Spirit, forgive, and know that you were sent. We're the sent ones. We're the sent ones. And it's an incredible thing, isn't it? As the Father sent me, said Jesus, as the Father sent me from heaven to earth, so I send you. And I actually believe that we've been sent twice because we're seated in heavenly places. According to Paul in Ephesians, we're seated in heavenly places. We've been sent from heaven to earth, and I would suggest through the church, we are sent again to expand the influence of King Jesus wherever we go. That's why you're apostolic. You're apostolic people. You're the sent ones. We are the sent ones. One of my absolute passions in life is for everyone to know that they're sent. See, I don't want people just to think, when I really arrive in life, they'll give me a microphone and a title in the church. But that is a, that is a kind of a, a thought that is, exists in some of our world. No, you're sent. You're sent to be doctors and nurses and teachers and truck drivers and waiters and waitresses and graphic designers and computer operators, and the list is endless. You're sent. Being sent is actually an incredible privilege. Uh, And it is an incredible privilege to be sent. My my little definition of, of sent is something like this. When you're sent, you become so much a part of the family that you're trusted to go and reproduce that family somewhere else. I, I've come across, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a father of two sons, um, so haven't had daughters in my life, just got a granddaughter. I, I've got some spiritual daughters in my life. I've come across some people who try and say, you know, you shouldn't shouldn't give your daughter in marriage. You know, somehow people have tried to make it something old and old-fashioned and somehow controlling. It's not. It's a father who's saying, you're my family. I trust you to go and reproduce it somewhere else. I send you. I give you to go and do that. 
You see, that's what, that's what happens to us. We're, we're the sent ones, and we, we become a part of this family. And, and this is your family here. And, and you're sent. You, you, you come here on Sunday, and, and you worship, and you celebrate, and you're encouraged, and you're healed up, and, and, and you're taught, and you're equipped. But for one reason, that you walk out that door sent to reproduce this family everywhere you go. Because we're the sent ones. And um, it's just a couple of things about, about the apostolic. One of the things that I, I, I think is really helpful to understand. Now, I, loved it. I love the church. I'm not against denominations. But I don't like denominationalism. Denominationalism divides. It divides around basically what we agree over. What I find with the apostolic is that the apostolic is more about creating a culture. The denomination is more about creating a doctrinal line of agreement. But the apostolic is about creating a culture. A culture in which we can all participate. And, you know, really the apostolic gathers around our relationships and gives everybody an opportunity to participate in the beauty of being a member of heaven's royal family on earth. See, the doctrinal statement can very easily, and I'm not against doctrine, don't misunderstand me, but sometimes we, we, we found that we, we'd say, no, this is what we believe, and if you don't agree with that, you're probably going to struggle to be a part of us. Whereas for me, what the apostolic does is, Jesus is in the middle, so somewhere about where you're sitting, is Jesus sitting just there next to you. He's in the middle of this room. And our assignment is to be more like him. Now the doctrinal statement says there's a line down the room and you either agree with it or you don't agree with it. The culture says, there's Jesus, we want you all to be like him. And different ones of us are able to be closer to him in different ways than others. And what it does is it creates an environment we are all in this together. You see, he's good. He is good. And he is the exact representation of the Father who is good. And we're all to be like him. But you might be having a bad day today. And you might be over here thinking, I'm not quite sure how good he is today. But you're still in the room. See, the doctrinal statement might have made you think, if I don't think he's good today, I better get out the room. But the apostolic culture says, no, stay in the room. Be part of the family. We're all on a journey. He heals. He heals. He healed everyone that came to him. Do you believe that he heals? Oh, he might be having a battle today. I've been pressing him for my healing. But you're still in the room. You're still a part of this culture. And that's why, for me, the apostolic and culture go hand in hand. Now, you might have heard the word culture taught a lot or, you know, thrown around in our world. One of the funny things happened to me, I, I, there was a, a summer conference at Bethel. I, I attended it. My wife and I, we went to every conference, very privileged that, you know, years ago we used to have to take time off work and drive somewhere and pay for our hotel and buy our tickets and queue up to get in. And my life's a bit different now. And 15 years in Bethel, I got to every conference. But I'd never spoken at the summer conference. And the summer conference was called Kingdom Culture. We were about 10 years into this conference, and I, I was given a session to speak. And I, I spoke on the definition of culture. And I stepped down, and Bill said, for 10 years we've had this conference, and no one ever defined culture. Funny thing. Culture is it's important for us to understand what culture is. You see, your apostolic... And this family has an apostolic culture. Culture is the way we do things around here. It's the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. You see, I really do want to emphasize, I am not against denominations and I'm not against doctrine. But when the doctrine is used to divide the room, it's a problem. And denominations tend to end up dividing. And I believe that what we are going to see in the end times, however near we are to the, the absolute end times, I believe that we will see the emerging of apostleships. 
And apostleships enable everybody to participate. You see, the, I, I, I believe that this house, this family, is an apostolic family. It's my experience is this is an apostolic family. And, uh, and therefore, it, it has an apostolic culture. You have an apostolic culture. See, that's why I felt what the Lord told me to do with you today is encourage you that this is who you are. I don't want to slap you around and say, hey, you really need to read this. If you've got this right, you can sort your lives out. You know, sometimes preachers do that. I'm not doing that. I want to tell you, this is who you are. This is who I'm experiencing. I'm experiencing an apostolic family. And, and I believe that those are the two biggest elements of Jesus is teaching that we should see in the church. We should be an apostolic family with an apostolic culture and the relationships of a family. So what, what does culture do? Culture creates my language. It creates, as it were, the, the ground, this healthy ground in, in which we, we can watch good things grow. You see, the doctrinal statement would say, I'll, I'll use one, and, and it's, it's a little risky, but I'll use it. You know, so the assemblies of God require their leaders to sign a document that says that speaking in tongues is the primary manifestation of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it, it just causes problems. It just does. It doesn't say that in the Bible. I, I haven't found it in there. So a doctrinal statement will divide. Now don't from that think that I'm against the Assemblies of God. They're a most incredible movement that came out of Azusa Street and, and are alive and well and doing incredible stuff around the world. I'm just using an illustration. So, so that has a tendency to divide. And we can find that in other things. But what for me I want to see is a culture. So this becomes the fertile field in which healing can happen. Because it's a culture, the way we do things around here. And what happens when it's the way you do things around here is you tell stories amongst yourselves. And the more you tell stories about people being healed, the more people get healed. And the more people you pray for to be healed, the more people get healed. So you create this culture. It's the way we do things. So somebody walks in here and they're sick, and, and, and you put your arm around them and you go, we're going to pray for you. And, and if they don't get well, they may need to go to the doctor. They need, may need some help. But there's this culture that says he heals. And, and so we create this fertile ground. The culture of an apostolic family will include the supernatural. In fact, I would suggest it has to. So you're an apostolic family and you're creating an apostolic culture. Now, the beauty is, you see, that that lady in the middle there that is representing Jesus for me today. If you... She's doing a great job. It's her assignment. Be, you know, the Bible says, it says three pretty outrageous things. You're supposed to be God-like, Christ-like, and also Paul-like. I got the name right for one of them, so it's helpful. But we're actually meant to be. It, it should be true of you that if they've seen you, they've seen the Father. It's outrageous. But that's, that's the Bible. So, so you see, if, if she's Jesus, if she touches you, you're healed. That's where we're all trying to get to. But, but on the way, some of us are over here. We've been battling but we're, we're believing, yeah, he heals. And, 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 you know, today I'm like, yeah, he heals. And, and the next is, oh, come on, oh, where am I on this? But it's okay, I'm still in the room. I'm still in this culture. And, and what happens is the culture, as I stand in the culture, which, you, of course, we get the word agriculture, it's there. Culture enables things to grow. So when you create a culture that is a healing culture, it grows. And, and that's what culture does. There's about three or four elements of culture that I think are really important. And, and, and you have them. Number one is it enables things to grow. So when you come in here and, and, and you're being, you know, the stories are about what, that he heals. You're actually enabling growth 
more healing happens. Culture is also an umbrella. This is my way of drawing it. You know, if you go to uh, Spain or somewhere like that, they have a, a siesta, don't they? A couple of hours when, you know, you close the shutters and you have a nap after lunch. It's a great idea. I mean, it, it is, I mean, that is heaven on earth right there, you know? And, uh, and what is it? It's protecting the people from the harsh effects of the sun, the noonday sun. And of course, you know, it, it wasn't about you, but they, there was a little ditty written about us. You know, mad dogs and Englishmen stay out in the noonday sun. Apparently the Scots don't, but Englishmen do, okay? <laughs> what, what's, what, what is it? It's because we don't understand the harsh effects of the noonday sun. But what culture does is it protects us from the harsh effects of life on earth. Because we live on earth. So we create a culture that protects us from the harsh effects of life on earth. So you come in here and, and we're singing songs and we're worshipping and we're declaring he's good. He, he, he's for us, not against us. You step out there and there's a world that says he's not good. There are insurance brokers that say, I'll cover you for every eventuality except an act of God because he's a mean God. And he might actually do something that completely ruin your life and you're not insured for it. There's a world out there that says he's not a good God. You come in here, he's good. And we put the umbrella up over each other and go, he's good. He loves you. You're his son. You're his daughter. You were born to inherit a blessing. So culture protects you from the harsh effects of life on earth. It also changes the way you see. I love photography. And, you know, if you have a telephoto lens, you move the, the lenses backwards and forwards to bring something into focus. Well, that's really what culture does. It, it moves the different lenses of life backwards and forwards to bring a situation into heaven's focus. Let me, let me give you an example. It, early days out in Bethel, we had a conversation with, uh, I don't know whether it was Bill or Chris, it doesn't really matter. We, we were conscious that we were working through a process in our lives of, of, a, of some area of healing. And, and we said, you know, it's a challenge because there's these other people who seem to be getting instant healing, miracles, and we're in a process. How do we cope with that? And the answer we were given was this. We want a culture of miracles that embraces process. In other words, these, these two lenses, move them backwards and forwards and we'll bring your situation into focus. Because what we were told, and it makes sense, if you have a culture of process, you will end up not having miracles. But if you have a culture of miracles, you'll see the miracle in the process. Literally. And that's my story of being healed of prostate cancer by a surgeon, but with many miracles in the process. So culture enables things to grow, it protects us from the harsh effects of life on earth, and it trains us to see. You see, when the, uh, when, when the, the spies went into the promised land, the ten of them went in and they saw, my translation, big devils and little fruit. But the other two, uh, Joshua and Caleb, saw big fruit and little devils. See, it trains you what to see. See, when you walk out onto the streets of Banff, do you see big devils and little fruit or big fruit and little devils? It'll train you how you see. And what you see is what you become. What you behold is what you become. And that's one of the reasons why I know you're apostolic. Because you've got a guy here who's an evangelist, but he's kind of an apostolic evangelist. Because he's not standing up here and going, oh, Scotland, we're in trouble. It's all we're doomed. He's standing up here and going, there's fires being lit. There's fires being lit. I've read Gene Darnell's prophecy. There's fires being lit. Not only is Scotland going to be revived, but we're going to influence the whole of the United Kingdom. Amen. That's an apostolic evangelist. He's not looking and going, we're doomed. It's gloom. He's, he sees differently. And the other thing about culture is it affects everything you do. And the best illustration is, is the yeast or the starter, if you make sourdough bread as I do, that you put in the bread and it affects everything. The yeast affects the whole loaf. You see, culture affects everything that you do. And you have an apostolic culture. 
And, and the beauty of it is, you, you don't have to be ticking every box 100% to be sitting in the middle of the room. The goal is to get there. The goal is to be Christ-like. But, but if on you know, an area of healing you're having a tough day, that's okay. You're in the room. People are creating a culture. My favorite, to be honest, in terms of culture is, is, is the need for a prophetic culture. You have a prophet in this house. But what, what's also happening is there's a prophetic culture in this house. It's, I think it's one of the challenges of the United Kingdom, to be perfectly honest. I, th- I think we've got a reasonable number of prophets. I just don't know that we've created the prophetic culture yet. See, a prophetic culture, a, a prophetic word without a prophetic culture is like the sower and the seed. And it, it, you get given the prophetic word, the seed, but what's it land in? Does it land in the hard soil and just get taken by the birds? Does it hit the obstacles, the rocks that say, that will never happen to you? Does it meet the weeds, the lies that will tell you the false narrative? Or does it land in the beautiful, fertile soil and grow? You're apostolic. You have an apostolic culture. You're an apostolic family. You have an apostolic evangelist that's leading you. You're apostolic people. I'm not calling any of you apostles. Please don't misunderstand this. Because I don't want you, especially if you're from another church, please don't go back to another church and say, I heard this guy called Paul Manwaring preach on Sunday, and he said, I'm an apostle. I didn't. And even if, like me, your name works, Apostle Paul, it just, it it works. It's it's got a ring to it. It might catch on. And I don't claim to be one, please. But please don't say you're an apostle. I'm not saying you're an apostle, but I am saying you're apostolic. And you see, the nature of the the apostle was, it's it's a word that Jesus, he borrowed it from the culture of the day. In fact, he borrowed at least five of the biggest words that we use today from the culture of the day. Gospel, disciple, church, apostolic, and kingdom. They they were from the culture of the day. Massive words. And apostle was a word that the Romans used, and it was to describe someone who was sent from Rome to make somewhere else like Rome because Rome was too full and too busy, basically. And they took the culture and the way of life of Rome and they dumped it somewhere else and one of those places was here and that's why we became known as Roman Britain and they brought what they did in Rome to here. And they apparently built straight roads. I don't know what happened to them, but they built built straight roads, one of the things they did. And we've been sent from heaven to earth to bring heaven's culture from heaven to earth and through the church to take it out to expand the influence of King Jesus wherever we go. And that is our apostolic assignment. Now you won't find culture in the Bible. You will find Peter who said we have become partakers of the divine nature. Which for me is the same thing. We become partakers of the way heaven does things. So let me just give you a few. Now, I could give you a list of cultures, but what I actually want to do is I want to give you um, just some, they're more behaviors and characteristics of, uh, of an apostolic culture or an apostolic family. And, and I'm just holding up a mirror and saying, this is who you are. This is who you are. Apostolic family of Banff, this is who you are. And you're on a journey of creating heaven's culture in Banff. And and you're on a journey of of being trained and equipped and sent out with heaven's authority, the sent ones, to make earth more like heaven. So let me just give you a few. It's, and I've touched on this already, it's an empowering culture. The apostolic is empowering. It empowers you. I think one of the most misunderstood um, concepts in the church at the moment is freedom. Freedom, when, G, when Paul said it was for freedom that Christ has set you free, he didn't say it was so you can do what you like. 
There's a lot of people who think that's what it means. It didn't mean that. It, it, it means this. You are now free to enjoy all of the benefits of being members of heaven's royal family. I mean, just for a minute, I use Joe and Yvonne as an illustration. Let's imagine Joe plays golf. And he, he gets a membership of a very exclusive golf club, which doesn't allow women to play. Okay? Right. Now, he, he works his way through the golf club, and he ends up being on the committee. And he pushes through a, 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 you know, a, an amendment to the rules for women to be allowed to play in this exclusive golf club, okay? And he wins the day, yeah? And he goes home to his wife and he says, we won. You're now free to play golf. You're now free to experience all of the benefits that you were excluded from. It's that. It's that freedom that he purchased for us. He purchased for us the freedom to experience all of the benefits of being members of heaven's royal family. It's different to do what you like. Do what you like is anarchy. Freedom without truth is terrible. And, and, and the apostolic is an empowering culture that empowers everybody to enjoy and experience all of the benefits of being members of heaven's royal family. And an empowering culture sends, it encourages, it promotes people. You see, to be honest, I've been around the, the more controlling church environment. And it's not empowering. It's gathering people. And it actually reduces people. Whereas the apostolic empowers people and sends people and encourages people. Empowering leaders attract people that are bigger than themselves. That's what they do. And the apostolic is empowering. It's not threatened by people going wider, further, and deeper than they've gone. See, the, the controlling culture, the person up here with the microphone and the title has to be the biggest, most important person in the church. That, that's not the way of the kingdom. And I see it here because Joe's recruited a robber. And he's not intimidated by Rod, but transforming the whole of the United Kingdom and getting it all saved. <laughs> they're a great illustration. That's why I highlighted it. Because we've got empowering grandparents, not controlling grandparents, which has created an empowering culture which you are a part of. Is this okay? Does this make sense? The apostolic culture, behavior, creates hope and joy hope and joy I, I read through what Paul wrote I was looking at, are there any key key words and hope and joy stand out now I'm going to come back to hope at the end because I'm going to pray into that but there is if you read through what Paul wrote you see hope and joy all the way through there is an emphasis on relationship rather than structure Structure serves relationship. Relationship doesn't serve structure. You see, family sometimes needs a bit of structure. Uh, you know, Bill Johnson at Bethel, if they have a, a family reunion, it's probably a couple of hundred people fly in from around the world. It's more like a small conference or a medium sized conference. Our family is a little smaller. But we still need some help and some organization to gather. Does this make sense? So organization and structure serves family, not the other way around. And family and the, I mean, I could, I could go down many tangents about relationship, but heaven's government is family. The government is on the shoulders of a son. I always say, if I, if I was to have tattoos, I would have government just there on my shoulder. Government's on the shoulders of a son. Number, I'm not necessarily numbering these. The apostolic culture always has an opportunity for a demonstration of power. 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says, The signs of a true apostle have been performed among you. Signs, wonders, and miracles with perseverance. That's what it says. 
Now, some apostles plant churches. Some have networks. Some, some, you know, have lots of missional expressions. I don't believe that those define. I believe that those are a part of, but I don't think they're the definition. I think the definition is what Paul said, supernatural power. There will be a demonstration of supernatural power because the apostle is the sent one sent from heaven to earth. They have an assignment to represent Christ. Apostolic people have an assignment to represent Christ. Now, it might seem very obvious and very simple, but I can remember the first time I stood up and said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I thought, is that heresy? No, that's meant to be the truth. That's meant to be that we reveal the Father. We have strengthening and encouraging relationships with each other. Uh, we, we have, uh, we're in a little life group and uh, I, a doctor at the beginning of the only group that we've led, we don't lead it, we just go along, it's just our community, safe place for us to be. And um, we were just teaching a little bit, Sue and I on the prophetic and uh, there's a general practitioner in the room and he said, oh, I'm not sure about the prophetic. I said, you prophesy every day of your life. He said, what do you mean? I said, do you encourage your patients? Yeah. Do you comfort your patients? Yeah. Do you tell your patients they can do it? Yeah, you prophesy. That's prophesying. It's, it's that, and, and it's part of the prophetic culture. But encouraging and strengthening, telling people you can do it, getting behind people, encouraging, cheering on, is the apostolic behavior and characteristics. Come back to life, I, but there we go. There is an awareness and value for an unseen realm. Now, I'm very careful to say um, what, I, what I'm not. I, I try and avoid saying what I'm not, mainly because my wife will say, stop saying what you're not. And she's right. I, I don't see angels with my eyes, all right? I, I'm, not, I'm not that mystic person, all right? But what often happens to me is I'll preach and somebody will say, I saw your angel. While you were preaching, I'm like, I wish my angel would show up for me. That would be really nice. But I never dismiss what they said. Because I have a value for the unseen. And the apostolic must have a value for the unseen. Even if it's not your experience. You must have a value for it. You see, in many respects, you can narrow the apostolic and the prophetic down to two statements. The, the, the apostle brings heaven to earth and the prophet brings tomorrow into today. Both are operating out of the unseen. It's why the apostle and the prophet are the foundations of the church because they operate in the unseen realm and they bring it into the seen realm. And they equip the saints to believe that the unseen realm is possible in our seen realm. That's what they do. That's why we must have a value for the unseen. Now, I, I have grown considerably in that. I'm still waiting for, you know, for my first blue angel fly past or whatever that may look like. But I have an absolute value for it. If you come up to me and say, I saw your angel. And what's incredible is when people describe the same angel that somebody else did when I was in South Africa, it's like, I'm good. I'm okay. There's an unseen realm. So we have a value for the unseen. This isn't a conclusive list, but these are just some keys. And I'm really just shining a mirror and going, this is, this is who I've experienced being with you this weekend. I've experienced an empowering culture. I've experienced hope and joy. I've experienced relationship as a priority. I've experienced people who want to see a demonstration of power. I've experienced people who want to reveal the Father. I've experienced strengthening and encouraging. I've experienced an awareness of an unseen seen realm an ongoing relationship with God who speaks today I mean you might go that's basic but it's it's not that basic because there are people who are saying he doesn't he does you have that the instinctive confronting of the impossible the instinctive confronting of the impossible we're members of the Christian faith aren't we now if we went back to the illustration with with golf and Joe if Joe's a member of a golf club, this exclusive golf club that I made him a member of, you would expect him to be able to play golf, wouldn't you? 
Therefore, if I'm a member of the Christian faith, you'd expect me to be able to play faith, wouldn't you? Faith is who we are. You joined this family by faith. You're in it by faith. We need to walk by faith. And Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith? He didn't say, when I come back, will I find all the blind eyes opened? He said, when I come back, will I find faith? Will I find people who instinctively confront the impossible? A couple more, and then I'll just close with some prayer. The embracing of mystery. The apostolic embraces mystery. Paul talked about mystery. And this is vital. You see, in, in many environments, Christian church environments, we can very easily end up with there's an answer for everything. There isn't. There isn't. And the greatest gift that Bethel Church gave me was permission to embrace mystery. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's a key to increase. And uh, we, we don't know all the answers, but if we think we should, we will actually create answers for things that we have no right to have answers for. And we will create deception and we will operate out of pride instead of saying, I don't know. We fasted and prayed for Mrs. Jones, somebody might say. Why did she die? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. But I get around people who say, well, I think Mrs. Jones, she had a problem, you know. She had an evil twin or something, you know. They'll come up with some theory. Embracing mystery. I can, all of these are preaching points, so I'm just building on the foundation of others. Here it is, building on the foundation of others. See, that's what we're to do. For too, too long, the church has, has knocked down what went before. Paul said, one man builds and another man builds upon that foundation. It's a biblical principle. And, and I think us Brits are pretty bad at this because if somebody ends badly, we, we take their books off our bookshelf. What we need to do is to have a look at their book and see what they got right and learn the lessons. Because there's a few people wouldn't be in the Bible if we operated that. And Solomon's definitely one of them. And I'm not sure how well David would have got on, to be honest. And actually, if you take out of the Bible everyone who murdered somebody, you haven't got much Bible left. <laughs> you can check it out. Buy a pound Bible from the pound store and tear out everything written by Moses, Paul, and David. And have a look at what you're left with. You have nothing to, to read at weddings. You have no clue about creation. You have no rules whatsoever. I mean, you know, no Psalms, no Psalm 23, that's gone. 1 Corinthians 13, that's gone. Ephesians 4, that's gone, so we don't know anything about how to structure the church. We're in trouble. <laughs> but finally, let me end with this and let me pray into this. Perseverance that never quits. Amen. And I increasingly believe that this is such a big one for the apostolic. And it's such a big one that we need today. And Paul wrote, as I understand it, Corinthians before Romans. Which means that his list in Corinthians of, I was shipwrecked, I was left for dead, I was hungry, I was beaten, I was imprisoned, was written and happened before Romans chapter 5. Rejoice in your tribulations. He knew what this was. He understood it. Rejoice in your tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance. Perseverance. Perseverance, one of the few Greek words I know, hupomone. That's the other tattoo I'd have. Government and hupomone. That would be it. I'm probably not going to get any, but then that's okay. <laughs> Hupomone is the character of a man or woman of God, unswerved from their deliberate purpose in life by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Rejoice in your tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce hupomone. And hupomone produces character. And character, hope. And then the outrageous statement, hope does not disappoint how can that be because we often think I didn't get what I hoped for 
It's not the same thing. See, where the proverb says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. It's not that you don't get what you hope for that makes you sick. It's that you stop hoping. It's that you stop hoping. See, why will hope not disappoint? Because it will never take you to the wrong appointment. Now, I know it's not in the Bible, but Dante, in his famous Inferno, wrote, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. He hung it over the door of hell. Because he understood something. There's no hope in hell. There's no hope in hell. Because our God is the God of all hope. He got it all. You can't take any devil. You can't have any of it. You see, hope will always take you to the right appointment. It will always take you to stand in front of the presence of God. And you will have an appointment with the God of all hope. And I believe that perseverance is a character, a behavior of the apostolic. It's in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of a true apostle have been performed among you. Signs, wonders and miracles with perseverance. The, uh, I'll risk the humor, the great apostle Rocky. If you've watched his series, it's not how hard you can hit that counts. It's how many hits you can take and keep moving forward. That's what he said. And I, 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 I believe that there is an impartation, I want to release it to you this morning, of a greater measure of perseverance, a greater measure that is going to lead to greater hope, that is going to lead to greater breakthrough, and that you are going to be known as a place where people come in here with their trials and their tribulations, and they are surrounded by an apostolic culture that encourages them, cheers them on, believes in them, that tells them the goodness of God. And in this environment, you are going to be known for perseverance, for never quitting, for staying in the game. I'm going to invite you to stand. I believe that there is a we don't quit anointing on this house. We stay in the game. We hang on. We never doubt. Some of you, you've You've believed for something, you haven't seen it. It's a mystery. The world would tell you, change what you believe. But heaven would say, stay in the game. Amen. Hold that tension between heaven and earth. Hold it in your hand. God heals. And even though we saw a loss, we're not going to quit believing he heals. Some of you carry prophetic words and you haven't seen them come to pass. And some people would say, oh, he doesn't speak anymore. That prophet, he was, it was his pizza he'd eaten that gave you that word. But heaven says, hold on to the prophetic tension. Holy Spirit, I ask you would come. Hupomone is one of the fruits of the Spirit, actually. It's one of the words in the fruits of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you release in this house such a core strength of persevering, of hupomone, that it would be the character, not just of people in this house, not just of people in this family, but it would be the character of the house. That whatever comes, whatever storm, whatever disappointment, whatever criticism, whatever attack, that this is hupomone. A place where people don't quit. They stay in the game. The character of a man or woman of God, unswerved from their deliberate purpose in life by even the greatest trials and suffering that creates character, which leads to hope. And hope does not disappoint. I pray for a, the beacon of hope to shine out of this place. A light of hope to shine out of this place. To bounce off the buildings of this town of Banff. To be seen across the water in Macduff. And that the story of hope would flow from this house. 
because the people don't quit. They rejoice in their tribulations. If you're in a battle right now, I want to just invite you to come to the front. If you're in any sort of battle where you feel like, yeah, I need to learn to stand and rejoice in my tribulations, you're not rejoicing for them, you're rejoicing in them. I want to invite you to come to the front. And as the worship at the end of this meeting flows over you, you're going to, you're going to take this home. You see, what we've done for too long is we've come to church and then we've gone home and resumed life as normal. The church is meant to equip you to go home and carry on doing what you learned to do in this house, in your home, in your office. If you're in a battle right now, just come to the front because I believe some of you are going to be trained to rejoice in your tribulations. Father, I thank you for this wonderful family, this apostolic family, this apostolic, evangelistic, nation-changing, nation-shifting family. I thank you for it. And I pray that in this town of Banff, it will be famous for hope. In a world that needs the certainty of the hope of Almighty God, make this house famous for hope. Hope in mental illness. Hope in physical illness. Hope in financial distress. Hope in relational conflict. Hope when the world shouts hopeless, this house says hope. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's worship.